Hi everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. I spotted this joypad on eBay the other day and I had to have it because this is the exact same joypad that I used to use on my Amiga when I was little. And if it isn't already compatible with the Speccy, I can definitely modify it so that I can use it. I managed to find a review of it in a German Commodore 64 magazine called Fear and Sexiger. You might spot a date code on the joypad later. It's uh, 1994 and this magazine's from 94, which lines up nicely. Skipping past the feature on sex software, we get to the joypad review, their price hit. The review says that the Swift is a spin-off of the Quickshot series and looks like the Starfighter model, and they're not wrong. Look at this. It must have so many shared components. I'd like to get my hands on one of those too. It says that the D-pad is comfortable to use and doesn't uh, tire your left thumb out after long play sessions. It also mentions the lack of a second fire button in place of it there's a turbo button or rapid fire button and that makes it not possible to turn your ship around in the game they were using to test it which was called Eon. But if you can see past that then the joypad leaves a very good impression. The review also commends the good price of the joypad which is about 15 dodge marks. Let's have a little look around before we take it to bits. Looking at the back we can see the date stamp on the case, 9415, week 15 of 1994, this was made. Here's our comfortable D-pad which is going to look after our left thumb. Our single fire button and turbo fire button, we'll be figuring out how the circuit works that drives the turbo. And a switch which locks auto fire on so you don't need to hold a button down. That's all there is to it, so it looks pretty perfect for Specker games. Let's have a little go on Manic Miner, see how it's working. Yeah, the fire button isn't doing great. I imagine there's a contact under there that we'll need to clean up. Turbo button is not so bad, I guess that's seen less use than the fire button, which must have been bashed for decades by now. And auto fire seems to be working. The, the D-pad, by the way, is working very comfortably. So now for the fun bit, let's take it to bits and have a look what's inside. I'll be replacing these screws as they're all rusty. Maybe I'll try and de-rust these for use in something else. So the back comes off in one piece and leaves this front bezel, which is quite nicely made to be honest. Um, this is in Amiga beige by the way. I think it's made to look like, to, or to go with your Amiga. Here's our face plate, which uh, our butt buttons poke through. I thought it was hinged on, but it's not. It's just wedged in there. There we go, it comes out. And that leaves our rectangular PCB with some rubber contacts on from our fire buttons and our little slidey switch and the top of that comes off like that. These buttons are a bit manky, I'll clean them up before I put it back together. The contacts for the D-pad are all housed in this one piece of rubber. We'll give them a rub with some plain white paper which I find tends to clean up those um, contacts quite nicely. Here's the actual D-pad which is keyed so I can't put it in the wrong way, that's nice. And the front panel which needs a clean as well. So what about this PCB? Well, our cable comes in on the top there, we've got the D-pad contacts on the left, quite simple. We have our fire and turbo button contacts on the right. We've got the same um, rubber material on the underside of these contacts, which we'll clean up using some plain white paper. And in the center of the PCB, we have what is presumably our circuitry for the turbo function. I'm not too familiar with this kind of circuit. I was expecting a chip maybe, like a 555 chip. I don't think we're gonna see one looking at the layout of those solder joints. And yes indeed, it is just three transistors, a capacitor and a bunch of resistors. We'll draw a schematic in a minute and figure out how that works. And here's our back piece of the case which has a serial number on it, um, and that's just about it. That's all the components of the joypad. So we're going to reverse engineer this now, and it might help, if you haven't seen it already, 
to have a look at the video I did quite a while ago now on reverse engineering the Kempston joystick interface just to understand what's happening between the machine and the joystick or joypad itself. Essentially you're going to need an interface between your specy or your computer and the joystick or joypad that you're using. The joypad plugs into a port which is pinned as so for a Kempston interface and it's all explained in excruciating detail in the video I'm showing you now. Have a look in my back catalogue for it. In a nutshell, when the specy wants to know what's happening with the joypad, it reads in on port 31 and this data byte is what it receives from the joystick interface. The joystick interface's job is to figure out what buttons are being pressed in the joypad and send this data byte with the corresponding bits high so your game knows what to do. Alright, let's reverse engineer this thing's brains out. Keep in mind the table below and the pins on the bottom right. We can expect that this PCB has wires for up, down, left, right and fire and some kind of common, which could be 5 volts or ground depending on the design of the joystick interface that we're using. You might notice that we have 7 wires going onto this PCB instead of 6 and we'll figure that out shortly. So let's highlight common and see where that goes. Okay, as we might expect it goes to each of the 4 D-pad buttons and to the fire button. It also feeds our circuitry in the middle and goes off to the top right, more on that later. Let's start easy, we'll look at our D-pad. Up is the white cable, I'll highlight that white, it goes to this contact at the top there. So what happens if we press this button, if we press up on our D-pad? Well obviously it would short the up button's wire to our common wire and bring the voltage of up to whatever the common is and therefore the joystick interface knows that up's been pressed. Okay, easy so far. Let's release that button, leave that highlighted white, and we can highlight the next one. Let's go with green. Green is left, and as you can see, exactly the same thing applies. When you press green, it will be shorted to common. And the same again for blue, which is down, and for brown, which is right. Things are going to get a bit more involved now with fire. Fire is our orange cable, and it comes through here, over towards the right, via our slidey switch. Let's start with our slidey switch on the left hand side, which corresponds to not having auto fire active. We trace it through, it goes to these two pads, which is our fire and our turbo fire button. So what happens when we press fire? Well, it's exactly the same as with the D-pad. We press the button there, it shorts these two contacts and our fire wire is shorted to common and everything goes yellow on this color scheme. Good so far, let's release that button and we'll take a look at the turbo fire button. Let's trace the other side of that contact through, I'm going to use purple, and yep, it goes right into our circuitry in the middle there. We're going to need a schematic, but for completion's sake, let's first highlight where our red wire is going. Let's make a safe assumption at this point that the red wire is 5 volts and the black wire needs to be ground for this to work properly. Okay, it doesn't go far, it just goes off to the top right there, parallel with our ground, and it feeds into the top of our circuit in the middle, our turbo circuit. So in the top right there we have two capacitors, C2 and C3, I assume they're just decoupling capacitors to remove noise, but we are much more interested in what's going on in the middle here, so let's zoom in. As I mentioned before, we've got three transistors, a capacitor, and a bunch of resistors. Let's mark our resistors on, there we are, R1 through 7. We have our other capacitor, C1, at the bottom there. And finally, our three transistors all in a row, Q1 through 3. Let's finish our markup before we draw a schematic. Um, we're interested in the auto fire switch. We haven't considered what happens when that is slid to the right position like this. But it seems pretty obvious looking at it now. The output of our turbo circuitry, purple, is shorted to our fire orange wire so we would just be permanently pressing fire rapidly. I want to show you how this looks under the scope. This is what we've marked as purple, the output of our turbo circuitry, and it's a lovely square wave, frequency 25 hertz. That seems pretty rapid to me, and more on that later. Here's the circuit I arrived at when I reverse engineered it, probing around, and here's our purple oscillating output on the right hand side. I'm going to try and talk through how I think this works. Um, first of all, when power is applied, I think Q2 opens up because it will get enough voltage at its base, and this will allow current 
to conduct through Q2 and there'll be enough oomph there to open up Q3 and that will conduct our current to ground through R7 and our output goes low. While we're in this state, C1 is charging and as C1 charges, the voltage at the base of Q1 will be increasing until Q1 opens up. This means that current will be flowing through Q1 and R3 which is 100k and it won't have enough behind it to open up Q3. So Q3 is closed and our current, our 5 volt goes through R7 and to our output giving a high output. During this state our capacitor is discharging and eventually Q1 closes which allows Q2 to open up and the cycle starts again. I've simulated this and you can see the current flying around here with these yellow dots and you can see our high-low output in orange along the scope at the bottom. Uh, red is showing us the state of our capacitor charging and discharging and if you watch it, it just nicely oscillates. I'm not sure what's going on with these rapid oscillations at the end of each high but uh, maybe that's just a simulation feature. I did mention that I thought 25Hz seemed a bit fast. Honestly I don't know what is normal for a turbo fire uh, but I wanted to kind of demonstrate that. So here's a program which rapidly reads in what's happening at the joystick with turbo fire pressed and we can see it's not really on off on off it reads in multiple ons uh, which could be a problem if the game thinks you're holding the button instead of rapidly pressing it. We can see this in action in R-Type if I hold down turbo uh, you can see that sometimes the gun just charges up as if I'm holding down fire. Here we go in slow motion look at the beam bar it's rising and it fires off a charged shot when what we would want from a turbo fire is just lots of those little yellow bullets to keep streaming out. How do we achieve that then? Well we need that capacitor to charge more slowly or at least to take longer to charge so we could increase the capacitance of the capacitor. Let's try 470 and see what happens. Look at the scope it slowed right down. Maybe it slowed down too much so we might want to go for a slightly smaller capacitance. I think in the end I'm going to go with 100 nanofarads instead of 47. Yeah, that looks fairly reasonable, let's go with that. I'm going to swap that capacitor out and then try that test again. I've replaced it here with a ceramic 100 nanofarad capacitor. I can just flick the turbo fire switch on, I don't need to reassemble the joystick to do the test and let's see how that works. Here's our simple program to read in port 31 and nope that's not looking much better. Um, it still seems to be held on over multiple uh, queries. What's interesting is it seems to behave okay for a while but then suddenly gets stuck on and uh, charges up all the way so I haven't quite got the right frequency here and the more I think about this um, the more I realize there isn't really a perfect frequency that you can use. All I can think to do is to slow it down even more to a much more human frequency and I'm going to use this 470k resistor in series with a capacitor instead of the 100k one which was already there and that should slow things down even more. And let's run the test and you know what I think that's looking much better. Um, it's only on for what looks like a maximum of two queries in a row. Um, let's try it in the game. Yeah, I think we're on to a winner there. I'm going to stick with that. It's not perfect, it does try and charge from time to time, but it's good enough for me. All I need to do now is clean it up a little bit and put it back together. Oh, hang on, no, there's an electrolytic on there. I'm going to replace that first. Here's the new one which is going in.
We mustn't forget to clean up the contacts here on our buttons, remember the fire button wasn't very responsive, and I find just rubbing these on paper so it leaves a black mark is enough to restore its conductivity. I'll also clean up the gunk off these buttons which has gathered over the last 20-25 years, 30 years, wow, 30 years, before I put it back together. I'm cleaning the case here but I'm using alcoholic spirit which I'm super careful with because I have rubbed paint off things like this before with that so I'm trying not to get it anywhere near any of the white paint. Lovely! Okay, let's have a test run before we finish up. Yeah, I haven't quite got there with the fire button yet. I think I need to clean that contact up a little bit more. Otherwise, it's working brilliantly. Anyway, thanks for sticking with me till the end. Stay tuned for more coming soon.